Analyst, this is a, an amazing group of libertarian women who are going to be talking a little bit about after Ayn Rand. Please welcome to the stage our moderator, Joanne Shausen, along with Naomi Brockwell, Jennifer Azu Grossman, Terry Kibbe, Stephanie Lips, and Jennifer Beth Martin. Oh, I like my sons in there. Welcome, ladies. We're excited to do this panel. Um, Valerie and I were talking about it ahead of time, and she was very excited to moderate this panel, and then uh, she's, she got sick, and so she asked me to come, because that's what mothers do, right? <laughs> <laughs> so she asked me to come and do this, and I was very happy to, because actually when we decided that she would do this panel, I thought, darn, I wanted to do it. So <laughs> here I am. Um, and so I'm really happy to introduce our panelists. We have uh, Jennifer Grossman, who is the CEO of the the Atlas Society and former vice president of Dole in, for, for Health and Nutrition, developed programs for them on nutrition. Uh, she used to be a, um, a speech writer for H.W. Bush, right? And, um, and well, worked with Laura Ingram on her health in initiatives as well. So welcome, Jennifer and Naomi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Naomi Brockwell is, uh, ha it works with Stossel for Reason, and she's a former producer for Fox News and Fox Business. She is the founder and co- uh, and, and CEO of Rainsworth Productions, and if you're ever in New York, she's also the co-founder of the Soho Forum, which is a monthly debate forum, which I, we go to whenever we're in New York, and it's always great. So uh, welcome there. And Jenny Beth Martin, one of the founders of Tea Party, uh, not only a founder of the Tea Party Patriots, but was, uh, was voted one of the hundred most influential leaders in the world. Not most influential women leaders in the world, but most influential leaders in the world. And I think leaving off that adjective is really significant for just how important your work has been. Um, Stephanie Lips, who ha has been with Atlas Network and now is the philanthropic, philanthropic advisor for Donors Trust, uh, working all over the world with that. Um, she also headed up the planned giving aspect of Atlas Network for many years. Uh, she has a very close relationship with Atlas Network, as most of you know, her husband runs that. And she is also the mother of human and canine children. <laughs> and one of my closest friends. We, we have so much fun traveling together. and. Uh, with these ladies and and uh, we've always had a really good relationship so it's fun to be on this panel together and of course Terry Kibbe who is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Free the People um, Matt Kibbe of course is her husband and uh, they work together and and she makes sure that Matt gets where he needs to be on time and, <laughs> and uh, they've been a wonderful partnership I, I think um, um, Mark and I have that kind of relationship as well, and I think it's really wonderful when you work together and have the same goals and the same, the same priorities, and uh, so I, I admire that in you, and I, and I understand the, the good and the bad of it, too. She's also a co-founder and partner at Fight the Power Productions, and they have two films here this, this year, uh, The Right to Bear 3D Printers and State of War. Both of those will be shown on Saturday, so I hope you'll come, and they'll be doing the panels. And there. vote for us. <laughs> yes, and vote, yes, with the, the, uh, with the Audience Choice Awards. So welcome, ladies. We're glad to have all of you here. And I'd like to start just by asking you how you came into the liberty philosophy, liberty consciousness, and, um, and, and what appealed to you, what attracted you to it. Why don't we start with Jennifer? Sure. Well, I was born in New Delhi, India. I'm a Peace Corps baby. And I was raised by academic parents, very idealistic, raised in uh, Newton, the Republic of uh, Newton, Massachusetts. And my entire formative years, I had never met a libertarian, conservative, Republican, and had been sort of indoctrinated into believing that anyone who didn't ascribe to our Democrat liberal uh, outlook was either stupid or evil. And then when I um, got a little older, I went to college, uh, Harvard, which is hardly a bastion of conservatism, but I started to meet people who weren't lining up with a liberal Democrat viewpoint, and they weren't 
dummies, and they weren't sadists that grew uh, that woke up every day figuring out how to hurt people. So I just really went back and did some studying, checked my premises, as Ayn Rand would say. That was the crack in sort of my uh, understanding of the world, and that's how I eventually came to learn more about economic liberty, and of course, then uh, discovered Ayn Rand, and today I get to lead the Atlas Society, which is uh, dedicated to building on Ayn Rand's ideas in creative ways, so the rest is history. That's my story. Thank you. Naomi. Uh, I had an interesting journey. I mean, I've always been brought up with these ideals, and I, um, I actually didn't know what a libertarian was till I moved to America, which is fascinating, because a few years later, I found out that my father was actually one of the people who founded the Australian Libertarian Party, and I had never <laughs> known this. And he passed away when I was younger, so I never got a chance to talk politics. You know, I was an angsty teenager, so it wasn't really in my, uh, in my world at that time. But I, um, I then kind of ended up coming back to these ideals ideas. Um, actually, through Ayn Rand, uh, I was living in, in London, and one of my best friends recommended I read The Fountainhead, and, um, and it changed my worldview of everything. And it was like, wow, this stuff makes sense. And then when I came to New York, I, um, through that, through an Ayn Rand meetup group, discovered like economic circles, got super interested in Austrian economics, became good friends with Gene Epstein. He sort of took me under his wing as, as my economics mentor. I came to Freedom Fest. I became even more plugged into everything and everything changed from there. I just got super interested in monetary policy in particular and then cryptocurrency and how that, you know, changing the money supply could make the world a more free place. So they got there in the end. <laughs> Jenny Beth. Um, well, I grew up very conservative and talking about politics around the kitchen table. And about, well, actually 10 years ago, Rick Santelli had a rant on CNBC complaining about the stimulus bill that moved through Congress and that President Obama signed into law. And that was on top of the um, TARP bailout in October of 2008. And I was one of the people who was very outraged to see this happening. In Rick Santelli's rant, he said our founding fathers would be turning over in their graves and we needed to have a tea party like the founding fathers did. He also said one other important thing. He asked the people who are standing behind him, who, who here wants to pay for a home that, that your neighbor has and has more bathrooms than you have and they can't afford it anymore? And everyone was going, no, no, boo, boo. Well, I, um, I said, I have to have a tea party. The thing is, I heard that rant on the radio as I was going from one house to another, cleaning my neighbor's homes with more bathrooms than I had, going out of, coming out of financial crisis, personal financial crisis. And my then husband and I had turned down a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan, a government loan, to stay in a house we could no longer afford after our bankruptcy. So I, I didn't think it was right to pay for other people's homes. I didn't think it was right for my neighbors to pay for a home I could no longer afford. I got on Twitter, started tweeting about it, was on a conference call the next day, and a week later was one of about 48 people who had tea parties around the country, and six weeks later we had over 850 tea parties around the country, and I've been going strong ever since then. And we had one as well in, in honor of what you were doing. I remember it was on the 4th of July. We were with, uh, with the Verduns and we, we had, our, had our tea bags and threw them into the water. So it was really fun. Um, Stephanie, tell us about your journey. Mine is kind of interesting. I did not know what a libertarian was when I was 30. And I was hired by Bumper Hornberger, who some of you may know from the uh, Freedom, Future of Freedom Foundation, to run an event for him. But before he hired me, he wanted to make sure I wasn't a socialist. So he got on the phone with me and he said, are you a libertarian? And I said, I have absolutely no idea what a libertarian is. So he sat there and he explained to me what a libertarian was. And I said to him, well, I don't know if I'm a libertarian, 
But I can tell you, nobody's going to tell me what color to paint my house and how late my kids are going to stay out. And he said, ooh, you're a libertarian and you just don't know it. <laughs> so that's where my journey started. After that, he sent me um, Sophie, he sent me the story of Sophie Scholl and the, um, the White Rose, um, the woman that was handing out the pamphlets and throwing the pamphlets from the windows in Nazi Germany and trying to tell people what was actually happening. And I read about that and it just continued my journey. And I've been blessed enough um, to have kids that are continuing the journey away from socialism and libertarianism because uh, my son interned at IHS last summer. He's at Hillsdale and he's now interning with us at Donors Trust. So here I was. I spent 30 years of my life having no idea what a libertarian was and now I have a family of them. That's great. Terry? Well, I think I was actually born a libertarian. Um, but I, I grew up in a Republican household. Uh, my father would vote the straight Republican ticket, um, ironically, unless there was a woman female candidate. And then he wouldn't vote for the woman because we can't hold political office. Um, so <laughs> there were some tense moments in, in my house when I would challenge my dad on that. Um, I ended up going to school at Grove City College, which is a fairly conservative school, teaches Austrian economics. I think I started reading Rand in, in college, um, and she proved you know, that, that women were smarter than men and, and stronger than men in many ways. Um, but then I think one of the pivotal moments, um, I believe it was in 1986, I was at a conference at Stanford University, and I was hanging out having a, um, some beers with Murray Rothbard. And, and that was just such an amazing moment in my life, and it really kind of transformed my thinking and also got me on a lifelong journey to drink really good beer. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually raised a social democrat. I was, uh, my parents didn't really get too involved in any kind of issues, but I knew that if there was a problem, the government ought to fix it. And that was the way I was raised. And I went off to college, and um, a couple of months into my freshman year, um, I met a guy, and he asked me out. And we, as we were talking, he started explaining the, how the world works to me and, and the economy and how free market e economics can answer questions to just about every policy. And the more he talked, the more it made sense to me. It just was one of those common sense moments where I said, yes, of course, that's how it works. Of course, if I work, I, I'm motivated and have incentives to make myself better. So I work for money or I work for, uh, to trade for something that I want better for myself. And I have things that I can offer to others. And it all made so much sense. And I was so impressed, I ended up marrying the guy. <laughs> So, and Mark and I have just, uh, we've continued to write books together and, and uh, pamphlets and, and so forth. We've had a, a, a great career in the free markets. Um, Jennifer, would you tell us a little bit about how Ayn Rand has influenced you and more to the point, how Ayn Rand's philosophy can and should influence public policy? How, what should we be, what should our leaders be thinking about? What can they gain from the liberty philosophy? Well, she influenced me primarily to believe that it was okay to pursue my own interests. I didn't have to live for others. Um, I didn't have to be beholden to what other people thought of me. And that was enormously liberating as a young woman. Um, I, I became free of shame uh, that I didn't earn. I became free of guilt that I didn't deserve or inherent, uh, inherit. And um, I just really stopped, you know, caring uh, as much, quite as much, about what other people thought of me. And that freed up a lot of emotional space for me to make, um, to be creative and to think about what I really wanted to do with my life. In terms of how it should be guiding our public policy today, um, we have an epidemic of a socially transmitted disease which is going on around society. It's called envy, which is the hatred of the good. If you've been watching uh, some of the candidates in the Democratic primary, um, all they can seem to talk about is blaming the 1%, um, tearing down the rich, railing against success, 
and um, promoting, while they're railing against greed, uh, they really are the, the greediest of all. Ayn Rand called greed the desire of, uh, for the unearned. So um, that's the bad news, that socialism uh, s seems to be surging. The good news uh, is that the debate has shifted to moral issues. And I really uh, don't believe that we can solve um, and make real headway with our political battles and our political initiatives without having a, a moral foundation. Because um, uh, people, we, we care about fairness. Uh, people uh, want to be just. But we have to have a conversation about tr what true fairness is and what true justice is. So uh, that's why I think it's important to celebrate Ayn Rand and promote, uh, promote her ideas. Thank you. And Naomi, you've been involved most of your young career in promoting liberty ideas, and, uh, and you've done it uh, through broadcasting. So what do you think about liberty messaging today? What direction is it taking? How can we get the message out more and, and do more persuading in that direction? I think that libertarians in particular, we tend to be very fact-driven, and that's great, and that's what led a lot of us to the libertarian camp, uh, because we see the results of, of financial policy and, and government policy, and the facts are, you know, it doesn't work. These are not things that we should be doing in, in society, but the problem is, is that most people in the world will respond first emotionally to things, and if you tell them facts, they'll say, oh, it's a great fact, but, you know, it, it just doesn't speak to me. My heart is telling me something different than my head is telling me. And I think that when we learn to combine the facts with emotional storytelling, that's when we really make headway. I think the left does this brilliantly and they've really taken over Hollywood as we know. But they're fantastic at isolating a single story of, a, you know, say, a, a, a mother, a single mother who's trying to raise her child in poverty or something. They'll tell that story. And they'll be able to change government policy from just telling an anecdote about one person. You know? And although I disagree like, the, the, with the fundamentals of that, you shouldn't never make policy based on a, on a single anecdote. You're making a blanket rule for people you know, based on, on a single case. It's just not right. But we could definitely learn something from that. If we we want to tell a story or, or get certain policy implemented or, or change people's minds about the way the work, world works. We need to be isolating those individual stories and connecting with people on an emotional level rather than saying 300 million people are doing this. You know, there are 2 billion people unbanked in the world. We can't give those facts to people because people don't respond to large numbers, first of all. And second of all, they're not driven to action from these facts. But you isolate a single anecdote from, from uh, amongst the data that, that you think is important and just tell that story. I think that's the best way to get through to people. And I think we're getting better at that. You know, like Anthem Film Festival is great at highlighting some of the, the amazing works out there that are connecting on an emotional level and also driving policy or changing people's minds about how the world works. I think that's fantastic. I think we can uh, go even further. I know that, that um, you know, that you've worked a lot on, on making graphic novels to try to, to tell these stories in an artistic way. I think we can do more of that. And I think that's the, the key. I think our film, Everything, was, is a good example of that. Everything is about a, a mother whose child is dying of leukemia. She needs a bone marrow transplant. Um, she finds a match, but the, the person who is a match can't afford to take six weeks off from work. And the mother is desperate, and she says, I'll pay you, but she can't because legally she couldn't. That film changed the law because, because um, uh, well, I don't want to get, take up all, all of our time, but all the statistics about bone marrow transplants didn't have nearly the impact of one film about a true story that impacted um, all of the people who needed bone marrow transplants. Terry, you do the same thing. You're doing storytelling, but it's not really a women's issue, is it? It's, a, it's an everything issue that we women are talking about. I notice many of the films, in fact, most of the films you've submitted aren't about women. They're about men, um, and, and they're wonderful. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, about is this a women's issue, is it a men's issue, or is it a people issue, and what are you doing at Free the People? Sure. Right, so um, the phrase women's issues really drives me up the wall because issues affect everyone. Um, women's issues, men's issues, they all affect everyone in a different way. 
Um, and you do need to reach people. I'm kind of, you know, I love this panel because we're all talking about storytelling and how important it is. And that's, you know, that's what we do. That's how you reach people's hearts and minds. I mean, Anne Rand, um, she affected people mostly through her novels, through storytelling, um, with strong women as, you know, the heroine, um, not to belabor that point. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'm going to quote someone and I hope people don't throw things at me, but Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said, it is better to be morally right than to be factually correct. Well, so, so think about that. We are factually correct and we're also morally right, but our side has tended to focus on the facts, like Naomi was saying. Um, I was trained as an engineer, I worked as an engineer for the first 12 years or so of my career, and I like numbers, I kind of find them exciting, but I also recognize that most people don't. <laughs> so you have to tell stories, they have to be fact-based. We are morally right, we need to focus on the individuals and the people, and that's what we do at, at Free the People. I, um, there's a certain person on our staff that I'm also married to that loves to quote dead economists, and I keep telling him that that's really not the way to reach people. You have to tell stories. <laughs> <laughs> so Jenny Beth, you started the Tea Party mu movement, but now you've kind of branched out and you've, she brought us a wonderful film this year, Colin Va Validated. We're showing it tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And I was so surprised when I saw, I love this film, love this film. And then as I saw the credits roll, I saw Tea Party Patriots and I was so excited that Jenny Beth was involved. So tell us about the direction that you're taking now and, and again, reaching people, not just women, but people. Right, so we are showing that film tomorrow and you can find out what a balloon has to do with freedom by going to uh, watch that movie tomorrow. Um, it's actually the fourth documentary that we've done and we found that oftentimes our documentaries are a way for us to reach, reach people and do exactly what you guys are talking about, tell a story and connect the um, factual issues with, with real, real life interactions. This particular one is on intellectual property and I, I was inspired to do it after doing a Facebook live session with Congressman Thomas Massey and I, he, he's so brilliant and he went to MIT. I mean, he really, he's a rocket scientist. Um, and he was talking about patent rights in a way I'd never thought of it and I realized that we had to tell it in an, a much more emotional story. So that is what we have done and I think it's very important to understand um, intellectual property rights as we're looking at the next um, iteration of technology. In, in our country when it comes to national security and just plain innovation as well. We also are very focused um, between now and the end of the election next year on the theme Stop Socialism, Choose Freedom. On April 15th of this year we had 422 rallies around the country on that theme. We've done a short 10 minute uh, mini documentary about a man from Venezuela and his what he experienced as his country went away from, from democracy and to socialism and why he is opposed to that and he loves freedom. And on September 19th, we're going to do a rally again in Washington, D.C. It's on a Thursday and we're going to continue that theme, Stop Socialism, Choose Freedom. And one last thing, I know we don't have very much more. I agree with you about the women politics. I think that the left right now is doing every single thing they can to divide this country and they're using identity politics to do it. We've watched that play out over the last five days and it just gets more and more and more intense. You can't disagree with people unless, you can't disagree with people on the left without being called a sexist or a racist or, or any other sort of negative negative thing, they won't debate on what you're saying, so they just call you names. I've experienced that for 10 years with the Tea Party movement. And it's time for it to stop. Yes. Stephanie, you are the woman's woman. I've traveled with you, <laughs> I love traveling with you. I've never known a woman to interact with other women the way you do. Your genuine love for people just radiates. And it's, don't you agree? It's I just do. so much fun being with you. Yeah. So, as we wrap up, tell us what what issues you think especially affect women that liberty policies can especially um, help? Would it be parenting, education? What do you think? 
Okay. As you ask that, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about something since Lenore Skenazy's uh, session today. How many of you, like myself, I grew up in the 70s, how many of you were sent outside first thing in the morning by your parents? How many of you? You came in, got your sandwich, you ran back out, you came in for dinner, and then you ran back out, right? You spent your day outside when you weren't in school. Is, is that not how most of us were raised? Does that happen today? No. My, my big kids, I have kids that are 20 and 16. They lived their life that way. And then things have started to change. I have a five-year-old, and I had a neighbor call me last week and say, do you know that your son was on the front porch? And she meant it well. <laughs> she meant it well. But OK, he's on my front porch. I don't think he's going to be kidnapped. The 24-hour news cycle has us concerned that everybody is going to be kidnapped at some point. We have to be so <laughs> worried about it. Um, and I honestly think that it is, there needs to be a lack of regulation. There needs to be people saying, don't tell me what to do with my kids. I'm a good parent. My son goes outside and plays in his sandbox for six hours pretending that Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker are fighting and, and uh, Princess Leia is coming in her gold bikini and she, she's part of the action there. This is what happens in my house. And it doesn't need to be the government telling me what to do as a parent. It needs to be me deciding what to do with my children and my husband deciding what to do with our children as a parent. And I think that goes with basically everything we do. We don't need the government to protect us from every single decision that we make. And yes, we're going to make mistakes. And yes, bones are going to be broken. Yeah. But, but those bones will heal. And what's really healing at that time is the ability to become self-reliant, to be self-directional, to be strong mentally as well as physically. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do, not only with our children, but with our neighbors and with our, our friends and with ourselves. So thank you so much for being with us. This has been so good. And, um, and I, I appreciate all of you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.